Well, good evening, church. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. I trust everyone is doing well today and enjoying this beautiful sunny day that the Lord has given us. What a gift that that was. And uh, it's amazing just how a little sunshine and a little warmer weather when we're cooped up at home and we get outside and maybe go for a walk and open the, open the doors and it uh, helps to lift our spirits and know that uh, there will be an end to this and we'll be able to gather again in this building and enjoy each other's fellowship and carry on the ministries that God has blessed our church with. So uh, I hope you're doing well, and if, and if you are struggling, make sure you find a way to reach out to us at the church via text, via the Facebook page, via phone call, voicemail. Uh, we want to know what's going on so we can help you. We'll be able to do that. We've been able to do that uh, quite a few times already with uh, church members that have needed something. So uh, don't feel like you're putting us out. We, we're here to help and to serve in that area. So, uh, But we're not going to be able to do it if you don't let us know. So make sure that you uh, take time to share with us what some of those needs may be. Well, I'm excited about continuing our study in the book of Luke. Uh, Pastor Bill said he feels like he's been here a very long time. But it's been good, and it'll, it'll continue to be good as we... Uh, hear uh, our brother Luke's uh, account of all the things that the Holy Spirit led him to write about and uh, certainly be a help to us during this time as well. So, uh, Pastor Bill, come and share with us what the Lord's laid in your heart. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, that's one of the things that you can do to make our time online together even better, is to have your Bible ready, distractions eliminated, Try and get the, uh, the service on the, the largest screen that you can and uh, encourage your family to sit around and, and participate as much as possible. And um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12 tonight and verse 35. You probably can think back, depending on your age, to summer days as a young person, maybe in high school, when you were old enough to stay home by yourself, but perhaps both of your parents were working or whoever it was that raised you was gone, and they may have left you with a list of tasks to do. And you were supposed to get done these things. Maybe you're supposed to mow the lawn and clean out the garage and take care of the dishes and all those things on a nice summer day before your parents come home. I can remember my wife telling me stories of things like that. And like most people... Uh, We would tend to play all day, and then right before the person comes home, you do your best to to clean things up, and you rush, rush, rush to get all the jobs done, but for most of the day, you lived like you didn't have any assignment, or that it was going to be forever from now for someone to to come home and check on what it is you've, you've done. Well... There's a very important parallel that we have here in the Gospel according to Luke in this story that the Lord Jesus tells, this parable. In fact, we're going to look at two parables tonight. Remember, a parable is a teaching story. It's when Jesus used an earthly example to teach a heavenly truth. And so we're in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. The word of God says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the good men of the house had known what the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not had suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers." And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. 
But he that knew not and did, commit the, and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, take our time together as we gather around your word, and may you make it quick and powerful and alive. Help us in this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus is continuing to speak to his disciples, and remember, Jesus was teaching about uh, riches and placing your life in the things of this world and how we need to be careful to seek the things of God rather than the things of this life. And he brings us to this new parable, uh, talking with his disciples. He was speaking to a crowd, and then he brought it back to his disciples in, um, in particular. And he talks here about living what we would call rapture ready, living rapture ready, being ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. In our Sunday evening sermons, we've been going through a series called Last Things, and we've studied what the rapture is. It is that moment when the Lord Jesus will fulfill his promise. He will return to this earth in the sky, not making all the way of a touchdown onto the earth, but in the sky, and he will call up those that believe on him. He will rapture out, catch away in the twinkling of an eye in a moment, He'll receive the church unto himself, and forevermore we're going to be with the Lord. And that begins a timetable, if you will, of certain end-time uh, happenings. And that is the next thing that we're looking for on the prophetic calendar, is the return of the Lord Jesus. And it could come at any moment. And he teaches here, using this parable, about how we ought to be waiting and ready. He starts off in verse 35, "...let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning." Uh, the loins girded about may be a troublesome phrase if you're not sure what that means. Uh, we don't generally wear robes much anymore, but that was very common during the Bible times. And as you can imagine, running in a robe, moving quickly in a robe, even going to battle in a robe sounds like a terrible idea. How easy it is to trip over something that you've stepped on. For those of you ladies that have had maybe a dress that has been too long, you know how easy it would be for you to step on it when you're walking and trip yourself up. So what they would do is they would take their garments and they would pull them up and they'd sort of tie them off around their waist, almost fashioning a type of shorts out of them. And that would allow them to run, that would allow them to do battle, and it was called being having your loins girt about, right? Pulling it up, tying it off, so it's still modest, but you could move easily. Well, that's what he's talking about. I want you to be ready for the battle. I want you to be ready for sudden, quick movement, is how he begins this. And he says, and your lights burning. Now, for us, we just turn on and off a light switch. When you want light, you just turn the light switch on. You probably had this experience where power has gone out. And when the power was out in the house, and you knew the power was out in the house, but you still walked into a room and flipped the light switch, and nothing happened. And though you knew the power was out, you were still surprised that nothing happened. Well, in the same way that we think about how easy light is for us, it had to be something that they kept up with. In the Bible times, whether you had candles that needed to be replaced, wicks that needed to be trimmed, whether you had an oil lamp that needed to be filled, if you were not diligent about the light that you had in your house, then you could end up with your light going out, and then it was much harder. You didn't just grab your uh, pocket lighter and start your light back up. You had to work with flint and tinder, or maybe you had to go to a neighbor and borrow their light to, to light again. So you needed to keep that light burning, and it was one of the responsibilities of the household was to make sure that you had a light at the right times of day. And so here he's telling us right now what the purpose is. It's to be ready for the return of your Lord. He gives us an example. And ye yourselves like unto men, in verse 36, that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So imagine a household with many servants working there, and there's a master of the household, a lord with a lowercase l, who is over it, and he goes away to a wedding, and they're not sure how long the wedding's going to last. They don't know what time it is that he's going to return from the celebration and the festivities. It could go very late. It could be very early. And it's the responsibility of these men and women, these servants that are caring for this household, to make sure that they're there so immediately... Right when the master comes back, 
They can open the doors, they can receive him, they can be ready to wash his feet, they can be ready to welcome him into the house and take his travel-stained and worn garments off and perhaps get him ready for bed or for a meal, depending on when he comes back. They need to be alert, they need to be ready. He says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Blessed are those servants. What's the right kind of servant? He said, the right kind of servant is you want somebody to be ready. So, of course, they're not just going to leave their doors open to this manor, to this household. And so you can think about how frustrating the Lord would be if he came back, this master of this house, and he <laughs> knocked on that door. And it's, it's late at night, and it's cold, and the wind is blowing, and he's tired, <laughs> and nobody opens the door. What are those servants doing? Well, they weren't paying attention. They weren't watching. They weren't ready. Maybe they had gone to sleep, or maybe they figured he'll be gone overnight, or he's not going to be home yet. Whatever they told themselves, they weren't watching. And so he found himself locked out. But Jesus says the right kind of servant is the one who's ready to open the door immediately when it's time. They're going to be ready for the return of their Lord. They're not going to put things off. They're not going to be slack. He says, blessed are those that find him watching. Now, you can, uh, my son came and actually asked me the other night, I was um, doing some painting. You know, when you're stuck at home, you start to, to actually do some of those projects that uh, you have noticed that need to be done or that your wife has asked you to be done. My, we had some water damage back in December, and now we finally have all the construction done, and we're just doing some of the last touch-ups. And so I was watching the paint, and I was trying to figure out if the coat had dried yet so that I could put the next coat on. And my son's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm watching to see if this paint dries. And he's like, you're watching paint dry? That's not the kind of watching we're talking about. We are talking about someone who is diligently and ready to serve. They're going about their business, but they're keeping their mind on what it is that they're waiting for. You know, this isn't sitting around twiddling your thumbs. It's about being ready for action. And so these servants, when the Lord comes, this is an unusual thing that he's going to do. In verse 37, it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching, verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Here it says, when the Lord of this manner comes back and finds his servants watching, instead of them serving him, he's going to serve them. Instead of them showing honor to the master, the master is going to show honor to them. He's going to reward them. This beautiful picture of when the Lord returns and he finds people faithfully preaching and teaching the word of God, being a light, being salt, being about the father's business. When he comes back and he finds people like that, he is going to honor those that have been faithful in the things that they are doing. In verse 38, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, Blessed are those servants. Now, uh, some of you have worked second shift. Some of you have worked third shift. And we know kind of what those hours are in our minds. And the second watch and the third watch, you're looking at between 9 and midnight and then midnight and 3 a.m., something along that. That's, that's the, I mean, if you've stayed up waiting for something between midnight and 3 a.m., you know that those are hard hours to stay awake. And even more so in the Bible times, because when it got dark, people did the strangest thing in the days of the Bible, when it got dark, you know what they did? This is going to, this is going to blow your mind. They went to bed because oil was expensive and they didn't have an unlimited supply of candles. We stay up with our electricity and the lights and we're able to read and watch things and have entertainment until way late. And if you're working from home, you may have found out yourself staying up later because you can sleep in later, but they couldn't do that. So the idea of the servant staying up till the second or the third watch, that was very, very late to them. And so here's what he's saying. Even if it's inconvenient, even if it's at a time when you'd rather be in bed sleeping, this is the time when the servants, if they're going to be the good servants, the blessed servant, they need to be, even in moments of inconvenience, they need to be ready, not wasting time, not being slack according to their duties, but they need to be ready for the return of their Lord. Jesus continues on almost like a, a second parable here. He says in verse 39, And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. 
So shift a little bit and imagine that the head of the household, the person who's in charge, maybe the head steward, if he knew what time the thief was going to break into his house, he would have been ready for him. Imagine a thief looking at a house and trying to figure out what's the best time to break in there. What's the best time when no one's around or when everybody's asleep? When can I get in and take what I want and leave? Are they often gone at a certain time of day? Are they often asleep at a certain hour? And so the thief waits for that perfect moment when he thinks it will be easiest for him to get in and get out. Well, you can imagine if the thief let the, the head of the household know and say, hey, at 2.30 a.m., I'm going to bust into your house. I'm going to break open your shed. I'm going to get into your garage. I'm going to sneak through your living room, and I'm going to steal all your stuff. Well, you can imagine that's a terrible plan for the thief because the good man, the head of the household, the head steward perhaps, if he knew what time the thief was going to come, he would be ready for him. And you say, well, you don't know what time the thief is going to come. That's right, so you need to be diligent at all times. We get the parallel here. He says, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Jesus pulls back the curtain here and kind of shows us what the meaning of this parable is. And he says, we're not just talking about some being diligent at your job. He's saying, I'm speaking about the return of the Son of Man. The Son of Man being the term that Jesus uses for himself over and over again in the gospel according to Luke. And he's saying here, I want you to be ready for when I, the Lord Jesus, return to receive you. He says, I want you to be ready for that. He says, because I come in an hour when you think not. What does that mean? He's going to come in an hour when we're not thinking about anything? No, he says, we're coming in an hour when you're not going to expect it. When you're not going to expect it. I'm sure that the disciples thought, the disciples who walked with Jesus, who lived with Jesus, I'm sure they thought that he was going to come back during their time. And for generations afterwards, almost every generation has felt like their generation is going to be the generation when the Lord Jesus comes back because of world events, because of the promises that the Lord Jesus has made, especially people who lived through terrible times like World War I and World War II. And, you know, some people now are talking that we're living through this global pandemic. And in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, it talks about how disease, is, along with earthquakes, which we're seeing, along with wars and rumors of wars, which, of course, and so people are thinking this could be it. This could be the time. It could be Jesus could come this very evening, or it could be 100 years from now. We're not entirely sure. So what do you do? Guess that he's not going to come during your generation so you don't have to worry about it, or be ready so that you don't miss out on it. Be ready, and there's another parable that Jesus tells another time about being ready so you don't miss out on it. But here he's saying he comes at a time when you don't think, just like the thief comes at a time when you're not expecting it. The Lord Jesus' return will come at a time when you are not expecting it. I want you to look at something with me in Matthew chapter 24. We just referenced that in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is being very, very clear here that he is going to return at a time when people are not expecting it, when they do not think about it. We need to be ready. We need to not slack. We need to not let ourselves get distracted about things that don't matter. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse 36, let me read something for you. It says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall be the coming of the son of man. Excuse me. So, also, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came. And took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There's a lot going on in this passage, but the Lord Jesus in this Olivet Discourse is talking about what's going to happen at the, the end times. And he's talking about no man knows the day and hour. So when you see so-called prophets talking about they figured out from some kind of secret sanctified mathematics hidden in the Bible that they know when Jesus is going to come back, they are going against the explicit teachings of the Lord Jesus, who says, no one knows that but the Father. And so if you hear someone saying, oh, Jesus is supposed to come back at a certain time, friend, that's not what the Bible says. 
And so we need to be ready at all times because he comes back in an hour when we think not, when we don't expect. Another interesting thing here that just brought to my mind was that it's going to be like the days of Noah. People were living their lives like it was any other day. They woke up like it was any other day. They did their morning routine like it was any other day. They went to work like it was any other day. Uh, people were getting married. People were planning for the future. They had all sorts of ideas, and everything was the same until the flood came and the rains washed away that wicked world except for just those few that were saved on the ark what do we learn from that well it's not going to be an unusual time it's going to be a very usual time people will be living their lives as though hey it's a normal day that's the kind of day that the lord jesus will come back on also here notice that the lord jesus refers back to noah and the flood and the ark as things that actually happened so for some people that want to try and take the New Testament and discount the things in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus verified by citing the Old Testament this way, giving it authority, and already had authority because it was the Word of God in the Old Testament, but the Lord Jesus doubles down on that, teaching us these things. Look back with me in Luke chapter 12, if you would, to, to verse 41. In verse 41, Peter asks a question. Peter was the unofficial spokesman for Jesus' followers. He would oftentimes ask questions, things that they were all thinking but were scared to say. It seems like Peter was never scared to say anything. And what an amazing change happened in his life after the Lord Jesus died and rose from the grave. Uh, Peter had quite the change. That is for a different time, though. It says, Then Peter said unto him, unto Jesus, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? You see, Jesus had pulled his disciples aside for a time after speaking to the crowds, and now he was speaking to his disciples. I don't have this in the slides, but let me read for you Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all. So we go back, and there's all of these people around, and in verse 22, he shifts it to be just with his disciples. And so Peter's saying, hold on, do all of us need to be ready? Or are you coming back for everybody? Who is it that you're coming back for? Who is it that needs to hear this message about not being slack and not missing out? And Jesus doesn't directly answer his question, but he brings them to a different point, again, which is important because remember, the Pharisees, those religious leaders who were far from God in their hearts, though they talked a lot about God. They used religion for their own benefit financially, for their own benefit status-wise. They loved to have all the accolades of looking like religious people, but they really did not believe in God. They were around too, and so Jesus starts to set his sights on them once again. Verse 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful, stu faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat? In due season. So he returns to this idea of a parable of a steward, not just any old servant, but a servant that had some authority. He says in verse 43, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That sounds like something he said before. So the servant that's going to enjoy the blessings and the gladness of his master is the one who is ready, who's doing what he ought to be doing. In verse 44, he says, Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. He is going to take that steward, and he's going to elevate him in, into an even higher position of authority, where he will care as a manager over all that the Lord has. Verse 45, But, and if, that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat, and drink, and to be drunken, so now he's contrasting. He says, we know what the blessed servant looks like. He is rapture ready. He is ready for the Lord to return. He knows that he needs to be not slack, but diligent about the time that he has, because his Lord could return at any moment. But now there's a, there's a servant who says to himself, you know what? He's, he's not going to come back soon. I don't have to worry about him coming back. What I'm going to do right now is take the things that I have, which are really not his, He's just managing them, and he starts to mismanage them. He starts to take the authority he has and uses it to indulge himself, to overindulge himself 
and the temporary power, the temporary things that he has right now. And so it says that he beats the men servants and the maid servants. He acts as though he's the Lord and he treats those that are under him in a despicable way. But hey, he's in charge and he's got the authority. He can do whatever he wants. Well, the, you've heard the old adage, well, the cat's away, the mice will play, right? The mice are not in danger because the cat's not around so they can do whatever they want. In the same way, here you have this evil steward, this wicked servant who then overindulges in the temporary power that he's been given, and then he starts to eat and to drink and to be drunken. He continues to act like the temporary things that he has charge of in his master's absence. He can just do whatever he wants with it for his own benefit. Instead of being ready to serve the master, he serves himself. So he begins to eat, and it's not bad to eat and drink, but you get the idea here. It says, and to be drunken. He goes beyond what he ought to into a place of overindulgence in the temporary authority and power that he has been given. This was a condemnation of the Pharisees. He continues in verse 46. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. So things have changed now in this conversation. Uh, now you're talking about the beating and the punishment of servants. Uh, this is different than what he was talking about before, and we can see that because he is now talking about stewards that did not manage things properly. And the Lord Jesus is going to offer himself as the king of Israel. He's going to return after what seems like 400 years of silence. You know, when you turn in your Bible from Malachi in the Old Testament to Matthew in the New Testament, for us, it's probably just one page. Maybe you have a few little pieces of note here, but I have Malachi here, and just a few pages over, I have Matthew. And so we tend to think that things just moved right along, the Old Testament being before Jesus' uh, earthly coming as a, as a babe in a manger, and the New Testament being afterwards. But there was actually hundreds of years when there was no open prophecy given. Hundreds of years when the Lord had not spoken through a prophet and given scripture like he had previously. And what happened with the Jewish people is they began to move away from the Judaism of David and, and people like Solomon during his faithful days and Abraham and Isaac, they moved away from the Old Testament faith of God's people to something new where the rabbis, the teachers were adding in different things and the Pharisees were adding in different things and the characterization or the character of the worship of God changed. Oh, you still had people that were faithful that were doing the right thing, but the leadership and the elite, they began to overindulge in the power that they thought that they had. And the absence of God sending a prophet, they started to use their authority for themselves to create new teachings, to create their own uh, religious kingdoms, as it were. And they loved the power that they had. And Jesus berated the Pharisees and the scribes. He took those Jewish leaders that were in authority that were now leading men astray, and he painted them to be all the villains in his parables that he told. And so what happens is they were not ready. They were not ready for their Messiah. When, the G when Jesus came in at the triumphal entry, at the beginning of that time period when the Jesus would be crucified during that week, people call it Passion Week, when Jesus came in and he presented himself as king and people were crying out that he was king and he went into the temple and he cleared out all of the wickedness, proving that he was king and the Messiah. And when he healed all of the people that came in who were blind and lame, he obviously showed who he was. And yet when the religious elite, when the religious leaders of that day saw him doing those miracles, instead of receiving him, they said, we don't want you. He was an unwanted Messiah. They were not ready for him. And so the children of Israel as a nation, as a whole, missed out. They missed out. And they were condemned greater because they should have known better. In verse 47, it says, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself. They had the Old Testament. They had the heroes of the faith and the type of lives that they lived. 
They had the temple and all the symbolism of the sacrifices to go with it. They had all of these things, and yet they did not follow them. And they made their own things, their own ideas, and tried to pass them off as though they were the commandments of God when they were really just the commandments of men. And they missed out, and they were condemned the more because they knew much. You see, it, it ends here in verse 48 by saying, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom many, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. They had been given so much and did wrong with it, versus the person that didn't know any better. So there is a greater responsibility, a greater culpability to people who know what the right thing is and don't do it versus those who really didn't know what was right and did wrong anyway. If you knew what was right and you knew your master's will and you didn't do it, big time problems. But for those that were under them and didn't know that they were doing wrong, less punishment. What, what are we supposed to take away from this? What are we supposed to take away from this? Um, let me give you one illustration before we move on. Imagine that you had children, and some of you that's not hard to imagine, but you had children, and you came to find your children doing something they ought not to be doing. They were being clearly dangerous or disobedient, and one of your children perhaps was 14 years old or 15 years old, and one of your children was five. Who is going to be more in trouble for doing wrong? They were both involved in it, but who should we expect more out of? Well, the teenager ought to know better than the five-year-old. You know, when my kids are young and they do foolish things or dangerous things, there's a whole lot more mercy there because they don't really understand the dangers that they're involved in. They don't totally get why it's wrong. Maybe they didn't even know that it was wrong. They did wrong, but they didn't know that it was wrong. But the older child absolutely knew what they were doing. And so they have the greater responsibility to do right. So now let's look at a few key applications we can make. We need to watch with readiness for the Lord's return. We need to watch with readiness for the Lord's return. We need to believe that he is coming back and live it. You know, even in the Bible times, people were saying, well, he made these promises and he hasn't come back yet. So maybe he's just being slack. Maybe he's being lazy. Maybe he's not going to come back. And the Bible clearly teaches us that that's not the case. It is out of God's mercy that the Lord Jesus hasn't come back. A certain chapter will end. There will be a closing of a certain portion of history when he comes back, and it will be a terrible time for people afterwards. And many people will not be saved, and those that will be saved will be saved under terrible circumstances, and they'll wish that they had gotten saved beforehand, many of which will lose their lives as martyrs. And so the Lord Jesus, during this free, open period, when anyone can come to him for salvation, eternal life is offered as a free gift. The Lord Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. He lived a sinless life, so he had no sins to pay for. You see, we're sinners. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us have done right as we ought to have. And because of that, we all deserve death and punishment. We all deserve the hell that has been promised to us. But the Lord Jesus didn't. So when he stepped into our place to die in our place and for us, God's wrath against sin was placed on the Lord Jesus instead of on you and me. And Jesus died, truly died, and bodily rose from the grave, showing that he didn't stay dead, but he has the power of eternal life which he gives to you and gives to me. That's the gospel, the death and resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we believe that and ask him to forgive our sins and be our savior, we can know for sure that heaven is our home and that the Lord is with us and that we can have eternal life, not just there, but we can start living a supernaturally empowered life now. You see, we need to believe that he is coming back and live like it. Live like it. Um, he is not slack concerning his promises. Watching doesn't mean inactivity. Some people get the idea that we're just going to stay here and hold the fort. You know, nothing can be done for God during this time period. All the great things for God have been done in the past, and so we ought to just sit here, twiddle our thumbs. Yeah, let the church dwindle down and just kind of keep going through the motions. 
But that's not the kind of watching that the Lord Jesus has encouraged us to. We ought to be busy. We ought to be those servants who are working until the point that the Lord Jesus comes. We need to keep the light burning. I want you to think about a lighthouse. Uh, we have all sorts of tools now on our boats, GPS and the like, radar and the like, so that they don't end up running into coral reefs, so they don't end up uh, grounding their ships on the shore by sailing too close. But there was a day when there were reefs or rocky outcroppings or the coast, and they only had, the, the sailors only had the stars and maybe some basic navigation tools and maps to go off of, and they would see a lighthouse, and a lighthouse would be placed somewhere so they could shine a light out to sailors as a, as a point of reference so that they would know that there is something there. They could figure out a little bit about where they are so that they didn't run aground of rocks or get too close to the shallows. Well, if the person who was in charge of the lighthouse let the light go out, because it didn't start out being electric, it started out having more of a, a lantern and a mirror system. If they let that go out, think of the danger then to all of those people that are at sea because they did not keep their light burning. In the same way, you and I, we are commanded by Christ to be salt and light, to reveal the truth of God, and to try and season this world with holiness when this world is filled with sinfulness. We're to be that preserving and that lighthouse to this world. And we have no time to waste in it because it could be any moment when our opportunity is done. We need to watch with readiness for the Lord's return. Second of all, we need to not forget the Lord and end up living for this world. We need to not forget the Lord and end up living for this world. That wicked servant who beat the men and the maid servants underneath him, who ate and drank and became drunken, that's an example of somebody who is indulging in the temporary things that they have. That steward had temporary authority while the Lord was away, while his master was away. As soon as his master came back, he's going to realize he was never truly an owner of those things. He was just temporarily using them. You and I have been put in this world temporarily. You may live a hundred years, but I want you to know that your hundred years of life will seem like a temporary blip once you step into eternity. When we step into eternity together, we're going to look back about when we were living, and it's going to seem like it was that big. Just a little short time. Hey, do you remember when we were living on earth before we came to be with the Lord? And we're like, yeah, I, I remember that. And I think that our minds will be such where we could remember the details, but it will seem like such a quick thing. You know when you get back from a vacation, and it's been a couple of days since you've gotten back, and you're back in the routine, and you think back over your vacation, you say, wow, that went way too fast. That went way too fast. I think that's how we're going to respond. So we need to not get caught up in the temporary things of this life and start thinking that we're going to build our own little kingdom here and work for ourselves here like that wicked servant did. He bent all of the things that should have been used for the master to himself, and he began in, to be indulgent, overindulgent. And that's a danger for you and I. If we plant our roots too deep in this world, we will forget that we're pilgrims. We'll forget that we're traveling through, that this world is not our home. If you're a child of God, if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, then you have citizenship in heaven. That's, your passport has been issued from heaven. You don't belong here anymore. We are in this world, but we don't belong. We're not of this world anymore. And so our reward is not to be received here. It's to be in heaven. Jesus talked about how when the Lord came back, he was going to honor those people who were waiting and ready for him. Instead, this wicked servant, he took the reward of taking those temporary things now and living in the pleasure of them now for what they brought him now. And when he comes back, it says that there would be great punishment for him. It said that he'll be cut in sunder. Now, you probably wonder what that is. Well, it is a phrase that was used for extreme punishment, severe punishment. When I was down in Tennessee, I learned some new phrases um, from the South that we don't normally use up here. And when somebody was going to get really scathed verbally, when someone was going to have the riot act read to them, when they were going to be told what for, they would say that someone would get their face ripped off. I, I thought that that was a rather uh, harsh statement, and in fact, I didn't totally understand it, but that was a common phrase that people used. Well, this servant was going to get his face ripped off because he was now living for the wrong things. Our reward is not to be found here, though there are blessings here, but our main reward is to be in heaven. Lastly, we have been given much, and so much is required of us. 
You probably think back to uh, Spider-Man and how his uncle talks about um, the great power that he's been given, and so now he has great responsibility. If you've ever read those comics in the newspaper or growing up perhaps as a child, or even in the recent renditions of him. Uh, it started with Jesus. It didn't start with Uncle Ben. And Jesus here said, to whom much is given, much shall be required. The Jewish people at this time who had turned away from God, there were true believers, but they, that had turned away from God to a form of dead rabbinic Judaism. They were being shown to have been the ones who were given much and did not live up to it. I want you to know, though, that we have been given so much more as New Testament believers. What we have in God now is so far greater than what people had in the Old Testament, it's hard to compare it. You and I have a finished Bible. In the Old Testament, uh, they may have only had the first five books of the Bible. There were some times before Scripture was written where they just had to follow God for themselves and memorize things that were told them uh, orally. And then as they went on, maybe they had the prophets too, but they didn't have the latter prophets. And so we have an entire Bible, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament. We have the full revelation of who God is. And so we're held accountable for that. It is a great blessing to have because now we know the answers to the test. But if you know the answers to the test and you still fail the test, more the shame because you didn't pay attention to the answers that you had. Moreover than that, we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. In the Old Testament, only the greatest heroes had the Spirit of God come on them and came on them for a temporary time to do great things, whether it was to author Scripture, whether it was to defeat the enemies of the Lord. It was something that came and usually went. You and I, we have the Spirit living inside of us now, and He will never leave us nor forsake us. He now indwells. He moved in. Before, he would come upon somebody, and then when their task was done, or when they sinned grievously, he would be gone. You and I, we can't sin so badly that the Spirit of God leaves us. We can grieve him, but he will never leave us. We have a revealed Savior. We know exactly who the Lord Jesus is, and now we can look back and see all that he's done for us. People in the Old Testament, they only had a Savior to look forward to, knowing what prophecy they knew. Now we know in detail who he is. So when we are in a Bible-preaching church like we are, where the Word of God is taught and preached in many Sunday school classes and line upon line, precept upon precept, we have been given much. Some of you know this because of your experience in other churches. Some of you have, who have only been in good churches, you may not know this as well. I had the, the benefit of being in pretty much entirely good churches when it came to being a member. I was a member here at Columbia Road Baptist Church as a teenager and as a college student. Uh, when I was down at school at Ohio State, I was a member at North Columbus Baptist Church where Pastor Dan Wolven faithfully preached the scriptures. And then I moved down to Tennessee where I was a member of the Temple Baptist Church where Clarence Sexton was preacher. And so I had just had the benefit of Pastor Jenkins and uh, Pastor Wolven and Pastor Sexton. And I had never known anything other than good Bible preaching and teaching until I would travel. And I'd show up places, and people wouldn't be preaching the Word of God. I remember the first few times I was trying to find a, a church down at college, and I thought all Baptist churches would be the same. And so I popped into a whole bunch of different ones, and I'll tell you what, some people weren't preaching the Word. I remember before I was newly saved, maybe a year or two, and I ended up going to some um, Baptist preaching-type gathering, and uh, I didn't even know I was going to be called to be a pastor. I had no formal training at this time. I was maybe saved two, three years at most. And I walked out of a sermon, and my, my wife was there. I think we were just engaged at that time, and, and we were traveling with my family and whatnot. And uh, I thought to myself as I was speaking with her, I think I even said it, I thought, I could have done better. And when I said that, it was the untrained, ignorant, brand-new Christian felt like he could have done better with the Scriptures. Why? Because I'd been exposed to such good preaching. Well, you and I who get this week after week, we are responsible for the things that we now know. Folks that go to churches where they're not preaching the truth, they don't have quite the responsibility as we do if we understand what the scriptures are teaching. So let us live in Christ's power so that we can do what it is we know is right. You see, the problem with us is probably not that we don't know what is right and wrong. I know that's not the problem with me. My problem is doing what's right and wrong. Most of the sin that I commit now isn't out of ignorance. 
It's out of living in the flesh instead of living in the spirit. It's out of taking steps that are unwise, that are leading me down a path where I ought not to, and then I find myself in the moment, not empowered by the Spirit. Oh, he's there. I'm just not getting out of the way and letting him live through me. I'm trying to live through me. And then I realize what I've done, and I have to turn things back over to him. So what are some questions? Well, we'll post some of these questions at around 8 o'clock tonight on our Facebook group. If you're not a part of that, I want to encourage you to look up Columbia Road Baptist Church, not the page, but the group, and ask to join, and we'll add you in, and we can discuss these together. What does it look like? What does it look like when we forget the Lord and go about our daily lives without him? When we end up like that wicked servant, and we leave the Lord out of our plans, and we're just living for the temporary things now, what does it look like when we leave the Lord? We forget the Lord, and we go about our daily lives without him. What does that look like? Second of all, what are some things that we can practically do, routinely do, to help us live rapture-ready lives, lives that are ready for the Lord to come back at any moment? How can we keep our eyes on Jesus and not on the distractions of this world? And then finally, how would you explain this idea of watching? Not an inactive, inattentive type watching. You've, you've probably seen the picture of um, somebody sitting there watching the TV with their mouth half hanging open, where people will say, you know, they're catching flies because their mouth is open. Not that kind of uh, turned off, switched off watching, but how would you explain this biblical concept of watching to a child? If you and I could explain that to someone who is perhaps five years old, then you and I might have truly discovered the meaning of that. So how would you explain this idea of watching with readiness to a child? The, spirit of, the, the word of God says here, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Let's pray together. Father, help us to be ready. This world is so full of distraction and it's so easy to get pushed around and pushed aside and the priorities, the right things of life to take a spot that's too big for them when you should be in that rightful place. I pray that you'd show us yourself afresh and anew, help us to get our eyes off of the temporary and onto the eternal, and to know that uh, we're not living for the things here. We should be watching and waiting for your return. And whether we meet you there or you come for us here, Lord, we know that we have a meeting with you, and we want to be ready for that day. Help us to be intentional about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, if you're able to go on Facebook and look, we've shared a list of prayer requests, things that people can pray for. I want you to pray for our missionaries all around the world. We are experiencing troubled times here in the United States, and that is experiencing trouble in perhaps the most materially blessed nation in the entire world. We have so much. I know we are behind the curve, many people say, when it comes to uh, the testing that we should have and the supplies that we should have. But if you think we're behind the curve and you're upset about that, imagine what's happening in some of these developing nations. Imagine what's happening in Haiti. Imagine what's happening in the Philippines. Imagine what's happening in some of these uh, African countries where our, our everything is so much more prepared than they are. And our missionaries are there, and they're ministering in the midst of that. And some of them aren't able to just come back here because of the, the situations with travel. In fact, I'd like to ask you to pray for a dear friend of mine, a wonderful lady. Her name is Margaret Stringer. She was a missionary. She's now retired, um, but she was a missionary for a number of years in Papua New Guinea. And she worked with the headhunting cannibalistic tribes as a single young missionary. I mean, they brought her in in a helicopter and dropped her off, and she taught them about God. It was an amazing story. From Cannibalism to Christianity is the book that she read. Well, she was traveling and speaking, which is what she's done in her retirement, and she got stuck in Honduras. And when the travel all shut down and the, the flights all stopped, she got stuck there. And uh, so pray for her, Margaret Stringer, in her situation that the, the Lord would provide. Um, and the same thing, many of our missionaries are struggling without the necessary health safety things that they need, especially in countries where the social distancing doesn't work like it does here. They don't all have the accommodations of the American suburbs where we can all go to our own homes and stay away from each other. So lift them up in prayer. Pray for um, Carolyn Wojnarowski. She was having some really high blood pressure this week, and they were going to the doctor to see what that was. It was so high, it was kind of a, a risk. She already has some health problems, and this would make that worse. So pray that the Lord works out all the details of that. Pray for our folks that are serving, doctors, nurses, those that are staff members at 
uh, clinics and hospitals and doctor's offices. Pray for those researchers that are working on tests and vaccines. Pray for our country's leadership, that they would have wisdom and that they could get the, the truth and the information disseminated properly, that we would know how to uh, differentiate between panic and between being lackadaisical and finding that right, responsible place in the midst of all of this. And uh, pray for one another. Pray for one another. Some of you have gone through very difficult times, and as Pastor Steve mentioned as we opened our service, you may have needs, and some are, are hesitant to mention that they're in a tough spot. Uh, friend, it's not a condemnation towards you. These are just unusual times. And we have a number of folks here at the church that have volunteered to go shopping if you need someone to go shopping for you, especially if you're immune compromised uh, or you're of a demographic where it's just not a good idea for you to go to the grocery store. We have some things here that we are ready to give out through Nehemiah's network and disaster relief. We have some supplies that we could just drop off at your house. And um, so if you have needs, let us know. Or if you're willing to be a spy for me, and you know of someone else that has a need, but they're not willing to come forward, uh, rat them out to me, because we want to bear one another's burdens. How we love one another during this is going to be a hallmark about us truly being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I can't wait for us to get back together again. I hope you're praying that these things would end soon, that they would end at the right time. And I want to encourage you to keep meeting with us online. We're trying to put out content often to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus, trying to stream our services. If you have trouble streaming our services on Sunday morning, the reason is the, the, soft, or the, the company that we use to live stream, its services, is not just Columbia Road Baptist Church, but hundreds if not thousands of other ministries that are streaming as well. And so they're trying to get used to the, to the load. But if you have trouble, go to our Facebook page, or we now have a YouTube stream that you can look at. I'm going to send out an email about that on Saturday so that you can have those links. And um, you can also go to our, um, our website at columbiaroad.org live, and there'll be links there to our Facebook live and our YouTube live to make sure you can stream. Or if you have Roku, we have an app for that. If you don't know what Roku is, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We've got some exciting stuff we're going to be doing with Sunday School. We, have, uh, we piloted a live interactive Sunday School class this past weekend with our older teens because they are probably the most tech-savvy people in our church, and it was a way for them to all see each other and speak with one another and go through the lesson, and it's probably the closest thing we've found to being able to meet in person with small groups of people, and this way we can do it from the comfort of our home, and so we're, we're hoping to have a class for children, for teens, and for adults that's interactive if you want to try it out, you use a, an app called Zoom, which is free to all of you. We were talking before church, we're not having Zumba classes, we're having Zoom classes. There was some misunderstanding about that. Uh, I remember driving by a church that advertised that they had Zumba classes, which was a dance aerobic thing. That's not what this is. This is going to be our Bible teaching Sunday school classes. And so if you want to try that out, there'll be more information about it coming and in an email and at columbiaroad.org slash live. You can join those, or we're going to be streaming Sunday School right here, like we've done the past few weeks, if you're not interested in trying out that new technology quite yet. The Lord bless you. Uh, we're praying for you. We want to be a help to you. If you need to talk, if you're cooped up, if you're lonely, please reach out to us. We have certified biblical counselors here for both men and women, and this is a stressful time. And if we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus and we realize that we're in this together— and greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, we're going to be just fine through it. But don't try and be a Lone Ranger Christian. Remember that you're still part of a church. Even though we don't meet together in person, we are still belonging to one another in spirit. May the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful evening.